I recently made a video where I walked through the entire assembly code for the ROM monitor in the Apple One computer, written by Steve Wozniak, and I wanted to do a brief follow-up where I'll walk through what I had to change in this in order to get it to run and work on my 6502 breadboard computer here. And of course, if you want to build your own 6502 breadboard computer, check out eater.net slash 6502 for more details on that. Uh, but an obvious difference between my computer and the Apple One is I'm using a serial uh, UART interface for input and output. And so this hardware at D010 through D013 uh, doesn't exist on my computer. Instead, I've got the 6551 serial asynchronous communication interface adapter, and it's got its data register at address 5000. And the status register is at address 5001. The command register is 5002 and a control register at 5003. And of course this works uh, differently than the keyboard and display on the Apple One. So you know, at the very least, we're gonna have to change the input and output routines. So let's start by looking at the Apple One input routine. So it's basically these four lines here. The first three lines are a loop that it sits in until there's a key ready from the keyboard. And then this line reads the key from the keyboard into the A register. So we wanna change these lines to wait for a character from the serial interface. So we can start by getting the asynchronous communication interface adapter status to see if there's anything in the receive buffer. And then if we look at the data sheet for that status register, the receiver data register full is bit three. Now this was using branch if positive to check bit seven, but in order to check bit three, we're gonna to have to and it by zero eight. And zero eight hex corresponds to just bit three being set. So if bit three were set and we end it with zero eight, we're gonna get zero eight. If bit three is not set and we end it with zero eight, then we're gonna get zero. And so in that case, we can change this branch to a branch equal, which means branch if the result was, was zero, and that'll keep us in this loop until a character is ready. Then when we drop out of this loop, a character will be ready. And so we can load that from the serial UART data register. So that replaces the input routine from the original Wasmon. But note that we added a two byte instruction here. This AND08 is two bytes. And you know, my goal here is to keep the entire Wasmon within a 256 byte address block. You know, thankfully Was did leave two bytes unused, but now we've just added two bytes. So from now on, we need to be careful not to make any more changes that add code, or, or if we do, we need to find some other code that we can remove. So that's the input routine. Um, but you know, another difference with the Apple One keyboard is that the, the Apple One keyboard hardware gives ASCII key codes but with bit seven set, whereas the serial interface that I'm using just gives normal ASCII uh, key codes with bit seven clear. So this com comment here, it says bit seven should be one. Well, now it's gonna be a zero. And so the rest of Wasmon actually assumes that bit seven is always gonna be set. So we're gonna have to fix that somehow. You know, one approach would be that when we read in the key, we could OR it with 80 hex to just always bit set bit seven before adding that modified key code to the text buffer. The problem with that is that you know, now we're adding more instructions. So I think to keep the code small, it, it would be better to just change the rest of the code to, to just deal with the different character values that we're getting. So let's do that. Starting at the top, you know, here it's looking for backspace key as DF. If we look at an ASCII table, we can see that backspace is uh, 08 hex. So let's change that. So 08 for backspace. Then uh, we've got escape here. We can look here, escape is, escape is 1B in hex. So we'll change that to 1B. Then here it's echoing a backslash. And so backslash is not DC, it is, let's see, where is backslash? Backslash is 5C. And a lot of these, the only thing that's changing is that top bit is, is no longer set. Um, for example, carriage return is instead of 8D, it's 0D. You can look here, 0D is carriage return. And if we keep going, here's another carriage return. So instead of 8D, it'll be 0D. And we keep going, here's another carriage return. Instead of 8D, it'll be 0D. And then we've got a dot. So instead of AE, let's see, dot is, dot is 2E. Change that to 2E. Then we get a colon instead of BA colon is 3a, and then the letter R, capital R, instead of D2, a capital R is gonna be 5-2. Change that to 5-2. And if we keep going, yeah, down here we've got another carriage return. Instead of 8D, that's 0D. And another colon, instead of BA, that's 3A. 
Um, and then here's a blank or a space, which uh, space is two zero instead of a zero. Change that to two zero. And I think that might be it. Yeah, I think that's all of the uh, the hard coded character uh, codes that are in here. But there are a couple other places that manipulate ASCII values. Like if we go back up here to where it's parsing a typed in hex value, right here, and you can check out my last video for more details about how this whole thing works. Um, but here where it's XORing the, uh, the character that it read in by B0, and from my last video, we saw what that does. It takes the character code that's entered and it basically zeroes out those top bits. But now, of course, the hex character, whether it's a digit or a letter, is already gonna have that first bit set to zero. So if we XOR by uh, three zero instead of E zero, then we're gonna get to the same step here. And then the rest of this process will work the same as before. So I'll just change this B zero to three zero. And that's all we need to do to make the hex parsing work with normal ASCII. And then it's gonna be the same idea down here at the bottom where it's converting a byte uh, back to hex characters. So here, rather than oring it with B0 to set that top bit, we wanna or it with three zero. And so by oring a number with three zero, that'll map a zero through nine to three zero through three nine to get the ASCII numbers. And then to check if it's a, you know, a digit from you know, zero through nine, we wanna check if it's less than three A. So instead of checking if it's less than BA, we'll change that to a 3A. And then this offset of six is gonna be the same, you know, to offset from a, a you know, a, a 10 or whatever uh, up to uh, A. That's the same, everything else is the same. So we've updated the input routine, we've updated everything else to handle characters as normal ASCII characters. So now let's update the output routine. And that's right here, this echo subroutine. And so you can see these first three lines here, the Apple one is waiting for the display to be ready. And then it just outputs whatever is in the A register. And so we're gonna do something similar. You know, we'll output whatever's in the A register to the serial UART's data register so that it will transmit it. And then once we output the character, we'll have to wait for the character to get sent. And you know, in theory, we could check the status register to see when it's done. But as I discussed in a previous video, there's a bug or as the datasheet puts it, this feature works different from earlier designs. So instead we need to use a delay loop here. For the delay loop, I'll initialize the A register to FF, then decrement A each time through the loop. And loop until A gets to zero. And the loop will just go back up here. And you know, since we're using the A register here, um, we wanna put it back to the way we found it. So we should push it onto the stack at the beginning of the subroutine and then pull it off the stack before returning from the subroutine. So that's the updated echo routine. And if you're keeping track, this echo subroutine is now two bytes longer than when we started. So that makes the entire thing four bytes longer. And you know, Waz only left two bytes unused, so hopefully we can make it up somewhere else. Uh, but fortunately we can. You know, we've updated the input and output routines, but we haven't actually added any code to initialize the serial interface yet. So if we go up to the top here, there's this reset code, which on the Apple One initializes the keyboard and display here. And so we can replace all this code with code to initialize the serial interface. Yeah, you know, I've covered this in previous videos, but Basically, we just need to set up the control and command registers. So I'll load 1F into the A register and store that to the control register. And so that sets the UART up for 19.2 kilobits per second, eight data bits, and one stop bit. Then I'll load 0B into the A register and store that to the command register. That sets it for no parity, no echo, and no interrupts. And so that's all we need to do to initialize the serial interface. And so far this reset code is actually uh, three bytes shorter than the original. So that brings the, the total for the whole file to just one byte longer than the original. But there's, there's a problem. So if you watched my previous video, you may recall that this get line process down here has kind of a weird dependency on the reset code. So when it first resets and it drops through this reset uh, routine and goes into this code here, 
The original code expected the reset code to leave a 7f in the y register. That way, um, when it increments y here, it would overflow and then uh, just drop into the escape routine, which prints a backslash uh, and then initializes everything. But now if you look at our reset code, we're not leaving anything in the y register, so that won't work. Now we could just uh, separately load y with 7f, but that adds two more bytes to the code, so that's not ideal. Now before, it just happened to be that one of the values the Apple One used to initialize the display was 7f, but neither of these values here are 7f, so that's kind of inconvenient. But if we look at the code here, you know, increments y, and then it does this branch if y is positive. So really, you know, any value 7f or higher would fall through this code. So if we were using some value up here that's, you know, 7f or greater, we could put that in the y register maybe, but neither of these values is, is greater than 7f. But, you know, maybe we can contrive one of them to be greater than 7f, you know, or, or in other words, you know, let's see what it would take uh, for one of these values or what it would mean for one of these values to have the top bit set. So let's look at this first one for the control register. So here's the control register, and the top bit is the uh, stop bit number, or number of stop bits, I guess. Uh, right now we've got it set to zero for one stop bit. And you know we could change it to two stop bits, but I really prefer not to have to do that. You know, one stop bit is more common, and I'd prefer not to add that constraint if we don't have to, but you know, I guess if we had to, we, we could do that. We could change um, our serial protocol to use two stop bits. But what about this one? Here's the command register, which right now we're setting to zero B. Well, if we look at the command register, bit seven is PMC1, which is uh, parity mode control. And values where it's one, it says use but no parity. I'm not sure what that means. Um, let's take it the look at the description here on the next page. So parity mode control, bit six and seven. It says parity should always be disabled. Um, so any combination of these bits is acceptable. Awesome, so we can basically just set bit seven and it won't matter. And that's just what we want. So instead of zero B, we can make this eight B. And then instead of using the A register here, we'll make this the Y register. So we'll load that into Y and we'll store Y to the command register. So that'll leave eight B in the Y register. So then when we get down here and increment Y for the first time, it'll get incremented to eight C. And then since that top bit is set, this branch of positive will not get taken and it'll fall through and uh, execute the uh, escape routine and initialize everything else. So that's perfect. So we're properly initializing the serial interface. We've updated the input routine. We've updated the output routine. We've updated everything else to use uh, ASCII character encoding from a modern serial terminal. Well, almost everything else. There is actually one more issue we need to fix. And that's this, this mode variable. And this thing, this mode variable is set based on the character codes for dot and colon, if you'll recall from the previous video. And since those character codes are gonna be different on my computer, these mode values are gonna be different. And it really doesn't matter if they're different as long as the top two bits are the same because it's that bit test down here, um, wherever it was. This bit test is what's differentiating uh, you know, what mode we're in. And that bit test is just looking at bit six to determine whether we're in store mode. And if not, it's using bit seven to differentiate between exam mode and block exam mode. The rest of these bits don't matter at all. So the exact values that we're using really aren't that critical as long as those top two bits are the same. So here are the ASCII values for colon and dot, just so we can see what we're working with. And when we encounter a colon, that means we're trying to store a value in memory. And for store mode, we want a zero one in those top two bits. So somehow we've got to get a zero one there. And then for dot, that means we're examining a block of addresses. So we want a one zero in those first two bits, you know, because we're in block exam mode. Well, if we shift the colon left one place, We've got a zero one right here. And so shifting it left, we'll put a zero one in, in the first two places here. And in fact, that's already what the code does. So here, if we encounter a colon, we branch to set store and then set store does an arithmetic shift left and stores that as mode. So that'll work just fine. So we're shifting this zero one to the left and we get the zero one where we need it for that to work. So that's fine for colon, but how about dot? Well, for dot, we've got a zero one here. If we can shift it left twice, then that'll work. So let's try that. So right now we check for a dot. If it's less than dot, uh, so it's a blank or comma or something, and then we go up to blank skip. But if it's equal to a dot here, then we're jumping up to set mode and we're just storing that dot as mode. Well, that's not gonna work because that'll set the mode with the top two bits as zero, zero. But we could add another shift left up here and jump here instead. 
So I'll change this so if it equals a dot, then we'll jump to set block. So if it equals a dot, we'll come up here to set block. It'll shift left, then shift left again, and then store that as mode. So it's taking the dot, shifting left twice, and that's leaving a, a one zero here uh, in the top two bits. But that should fix the mode. So it's zero zero for uh, examine mode, but now it's seven four for store mode. Actually, I think it was always seven four, and this was a typo in the original. But now it ends up being B8 for block examine mode, and that's new. Uh, but it'll work. However, we did end up adding one instruction, this, uh, this extra shift left instruction. And that brings the total to two bytes longer than the original. But fortunately, Waz left two bytes unused, which was very thoughtful of him. So this will work just fine. And, you know, of course, there's you know, probably lots of other ways to do this. Um, but, you know, I should mention one other constraint that I was, was trying for was uh, to keep the beginning of the echo routine um, down here. So right here, this echo routine, trying to keep that uh, at address FFEF in memory. Because in the Apple One manual, there's this test program that assumes that jumping to a subroutine at FFEF will print a character. And I wanted the, this thing to work. So here's that program. It's got uh, FFEF uh, embedded in it. And, you know, with the modifications that I just went through in this video, this program still works. So anyhow, I hopefully you found all that interesting. I think this will probably be the last video I do on Wasmon for a while. But as always, I'd like to thank my patrons for making these videos possible. So thank you.